All right, welcome back. So we are on week four here, and in the section on the four instructions taught in the sutra. So on page 175, to examine oneself for one's own defects and to give them up. So verse 31, if I do not examine my own defects, though outwardly a Dharma practitioner, I may act, in the con I may act contrary to the Dharma. Therefore, continuously to examine my own faults and give them up is the practice of a bodhisattva. So everything that we think, say, and do are things that we need to pay attention to. So mindfulness, our last class on, on mindfulness that we did comes into play here. So we're constantly paying attention to what we do. But it's not just what we do, because if you just monitor what you do without any context, it doesn't really matter what you do. Okay? But in terms of ethical precepts, in terms of uh, advancing our practice and those kind of things, how are we doing in terms of those kind of things? How are we treating other people? Uh, what kind of problems are we creating for ourselves? And so forth. Uh, in the first paragraph, bottom of that first paragraph there, he says, as you follow a teacher, you can learn how to keep everything you do with body, speech, and mind in accordance with the Dharma. So broadly speaking, keeping it in accordance with the Dharma, but particularly the ethical aspect. And then he continues in the next paragraph, intellectually you can probably recognize right from wrong and truth from delusion. Obviously, ethics, okay? That's the definition. But unless you apply that in practice all the time, there can be no liberation. You have to bring your mind under control. No one else can know when you have fallen into delusion and when you are free from it. So keep looking as if using a mirror. You know, an interesting analogy here. It is, you're looking at yourself, you're looking at the actions, what you think, say, and do, and reflecting on that, reflection in the mirror. So we just pay attention to that and ask yourself, how am I doing? Uh, there's the story about uh, taking a bag of white rocks and a bag of black rocks around with you every day and then as you do something good you take out a white rock and stick it in your pocket or you do something bad you take out a black rock and stick it in your pocket at the end of the day you take them out of your pocket and you look at it you know how many white ones how many black ones are there am I getting better you write it down and then the next day you do it again and the next day you do it again and, and eventually hopefully They've got more and more white and fewer and fewer black as we go through that process. So there's different things that we can do. Even just reflecting at the end of the day, which is one of the, the suggested practices to do on a regular basis at all levels, is at the end of the day, you're getting ready for bed or you're, you're in bed getting ready to lay down, just reflect back on your day. How did I do? Now it can be a little bit harder to remember all of the details where that's where the rocks come in or you can jot little notes or whatever technique you have but just reflecting on the day to see how did I do and I'm going to do better tomorrow you make that pledge to yourself as a part of that and then at the very bottom of the page identify your own shortcomings but never those of other people so that brings us another dimension. We need to analyze what we're doing, how we're doing, and so forth. But we need to be careful about doing the same with other people. So on the top of 176, in the second line there at the end of it, overlooking a mountain of your own faults, you discern the minutest of faults in others. Motivated by your own ambition, you proclaim how you are taking care of others. You pretend to be practicing Dharma, but all you are achieving is ordinary self-aggrandizement. Anyone who like you, fails to check his own behavior from the very start, will deceive no one more than himself. It's like you've got the speck in your eye that you're talking about the log in somebody else's eye. Or no, it's the other way around. The speck in somebody else's eye when you've got a log in your own eye. Okay, so you need to be very careful about those things, especially criticisms of others. Um, now, it doesn't mean that we can't try and be helpful for others, but we have to be uh, careful about how we go about doing that. 
So then in the second paragraph below that quote, whenever you think or do something harmful or false, it is important to recognize it. Uh, in the mindfulness practice, one of the first things that we're taught to do is when something happens, to recognize it. Uh, the same thing in other practices, advanced practices, we need to recognize something that happens as soon as it does to avoid that contact that the, the word the Buddha uses is contact where the event makes contact with our evaluation of that and we evaluate it as good, bad, something we like, dislike and so forth. So if we can recognize there's something there and break that at that point, then we don't get caught up in all the feelings that we have or may have about that. So uh, a couple more lines down. As soon as negative emotions arise, swoop down on them with mindfulness. Hey, there it is. Whenever positive thoughts rise, reinforce them using the three supreme points. And the three supreme points are, uh, it's listed uh, on page 101, but uh, the bodhicitta, attitude, okay, we're doing this for all beings, being free of concepts or distractions, and dedicating the merit. Those are the three that he's referring to here, the three supreme points. And then in the next paragraph, he talks about mixing the teachings with your own mind. So the only way to practice Dharma authentically is to mix the teachings with your own mind. So we have to, to take those on and really begin to embody those. A few more lines down, being blind to your own defects is no more than the outer facade. This is a major defect. So we have to be careful about those, be mindful about those. And then he quotes from Gampopa, to be learned in the Dharma but not refrain from wrong is a hidden fault of practitioners. To hold profound instructions but not transform oneself is a hidden fault of practitioners. To skillfully praise oneself and skillfully disparage others is a hidden fault of practitioners. So we sometimes catch ourselves doing these kinds of things and we need to step back from that and review what we are doing because we may think we know what's going on in that life of that other person, but we don't always know. So we have to be very careful about doing those kind of things. And then continuing on below the quote there, uh, only by being mindful all the time, in whatever situation, we maintain a constant awareness of what should be done and what should be avoided. And so there are four basic downfalls that he describes in this next fairly long paragraph here. Uh, things to avoid. The first one is to praise yourself and disparage others out of desire for wealth or prestige. The second one is from miserliness, not to give what you can to those who are destitute and suffering, generosity, or not to give dharma to those worthy of receiving it when you have the capacity to do so. And we have to be careful about the recipient at what level we can uh, share things with them as well. Or uh, the third one, out of animosity and hatred, to abuse others verbally or worse with physical violence or harbor resentment against wrongdoers have sought, who have sought forgiveness and changed their ways. So somebody who's done wrong to us, but come back and ask for forgiveness, recognize that they did something and they've changed their ways, we need to accept that as well. And then finally, out of ignorance, the fourth one, to criticize and reject the Mahayana teachings or hypocritically to assume an outward appearance of Dharma. And what he's talking about there is we, we act as if we're enlightened, but in reality, we're not. Usually that's kind of obvious, but uh, some people try to act uh, like they're beyond what they've actually achieved in their practice. More generally, refrain from everything harmful and meaningless done merely to obtain wealth, fame, status, or gratification. And then skipping a line, cultivate actions that are in accordance with the Dharma and then the end of the paragraph and maintain constant awareness.
So that fits in with the Dzogchen, the idea of pure awareness, being aware all the time of everything that we are doing, what's going on. So it can attain not just to being aware itself, but also to the application of that in the context of everything else, and being aware of everything that we think, say, and do as a part of that. Then in the next paragraph, you will also need to stay alert and make sure you are applying appropriate antidotes. Now, antidotes are particularly associated with the path of uh, bodhisattva, and so it fits in this context quite well. In some cases, we still hear about them in, in the path of Tantra, and occasionally, although not very often, in Adi Yoga or Dzogchen. But the idea of an antidote, um, that there is an alternative approach to doing things, is fairly um, common in, Zog in uh, Buddhism. So then when you get angry, for instance, it gives this as an example, counter it by practicing patience. So patience is the antidote here to anger. When you have feelings of mindless bewilderment, the antidote is to cultivate a clear understanding of samsara and determine to be free from it. When you crave something, reflect how whatever it is that you crave is not really desirable at all. So it gives you some examples of, of the way that we should look at these things and kind of step back, create a gap, understand them from the perspective of Dharma so that then we can apply that concept within our activities. And then the last paragraph in this section, the ability to transform your own mind will naturally bring you the ability to help others' minds. So that becomes more the goal from the Bodhisattva. We're trying to help all beings achieve enlightenment. And so we want to not only help ourselves, but by helping ourselves, we learn how we might be able to help others. It's not always a one-for-one -one match. Uh, people have a wide variety of, of different outlooks on things, different experiences in life, and so forth. Um, but when we have an experience of having learned this, applied this, and so forth, then we can share those experiences with others within the context of whatever Buddhist principles that we're talking about and, and help give them some understanding of, of how they too can do that. The next section then, section B here, is give up speaking of a bodhisattva's faults. So analyzing, being mindful, and so forth is important, but being careful about the next one. So verse 32, if impelled by negative emotions, I relate the faults of other bodhisattvas, I will myself degenerate. Therefore, to not talk about the faults of anyone who has entered the Mahayana is the practice of a bodhisattva. So this is like harsh harsh or divisive speech or so forth. So if we look at the 10 virtuous actions, 10 non-virtuous actions, uh, the non-virtuous actions being the problem and the virtuous actions being the antidotes to those, those are the kind of things that we're talking about here from the perspective of speech. So then in the first paragraph below the verse, consider all other Dharma practitioners as your close relatives. But in many ways, all beings are too. All of them have certainly been your own parents in one life or another. What is more, all of them possess the same ultimate nature, the Tathagatagarbha or Buddha nature. So we recognize the equality, the equanimity among all beings. And so we need to consider that before we open our mouth. Uh, if these things begin to bubble up in our mind, we should recognize that and stop it there before it even gets to the point of saying something about that. Then at the bottom of the page there, last two lines, as the Buddha said, an ordinary person cannot assess another ordinary person. Only a Buddha can. Now, I think that in Tantra and Dzogchen sometimes there are opportunities that go beyond what is being said here. So that's Mantiana view of things. But in Sokchan, in Tantra, we're trying to transcend those in ways to actually help other beings as well. But even in the Buddhist ideal, we're trying to help all beings 
So part of that is when somebody does something that could be improved, we can say something uh, about that. But we have to be careful about it. It's not just saying something, you did this wrong kind of thing. Did you ever think of maybe this alternative or you know, rephrasing it in a little bit different way, for example? Um, but it's a little tricky because there's, there's some reasons for those words. Um, we can say things that can have negative effects uh, for other people. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. At the top of 179 then, all are like sons and daughters of the same parents that have taken refuge in the three jewels and the path of the Buddha's teachings. For example, all that is compounded is impermanent. All that is defiled is suffering. All phenomena are without inherent existence. That which is beyond suffering is peace. Those are called the four seals. And uh, so those are guidelines that were taught by the Buddha directly um, about doing these kind of things. So we have to use those kind of guidelines as a part of it and be careful about saying things that are inappropriate. Sometimes it's just best to keep your mouth shut. And then in the paragraph that follows that, even more closely related are those of us who have entered the Mahayana. So once we've gone in, we've taken the Bodhisattva vow, for example, we've entered into the Mahayana as practices and doing the various practices associated with Mahayana, the, the predominant ones being the 37 practices are one of those, uh, but also um, the six paramitas, uh, those are well described in the Bodhisattva's way of life, for example, um, also the four immeasurables, and those are among the, the most important important practices of Mahayana. Then on down, maybe five lines down below that in that second paragraph, treat one another with great kindness and openness. And above all, do not look for one another's mistakes. Once you start finding defects, you will see them everywhere and in everyone. Uh, a few other little bits through the rest of that paragraph which can only be wrong. Develop confidence and pure vision. Respect the Sangha. It's a commitment to the refuge vows. Consider all your brothers and sisters as in the Dharma as being free from faults. So our brothers and sisters in the Dharma are the Sangha. And there's different levels of Sangha. There's like the, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are one level of Sangha. And then there's all of the monastic community monks and nuns are a level of Sangha. Uh, all of those who are in a particular um, group that practice together, like us taking classes now or are going to a uh, teaching uh, by a Lama and they give an empowerment. Anybody that's in that empowerment is a Sangha and so forth. So there's all of these different groups of Sangha, but we need to uh, consider them as being our own Dharma brothers and sisters as a part of that. Um, I made a little note here on the margin. Dharma teachers are expected to provide guidance, which may involve identifying faults and making suggestions, but should be done with loving kindness and compassion. And we need to be open to their advice. So uh, that kind of contradicts a little bit of what's being said here. But it is one of the things um, when I go to my teacher and I ask him a question, if he says, well, you should do this, I need to take that to heart and I need to try and do as best I can what he has told me to do as a part of that. Uh, malicious criticism of other traditions of Dharma is a major cause of the Dharma declining and being corrupted. So we need to also be careful about not just individuals but other talking about other parts of the tradition or in some of the vows uh, in Tantra even criticizing other religions is not to be done. So all of these things, we need to respect things at all different levels as a part of, of that. Moving on to page 180, then below the quote at the very top, impure perception can easily falsify the way that you see actions of Buddha's office. Faults you may perceive in them are due only to your own imperfections. So that's really true. A lot of times we see faults in other people that are actually our own faults. 
And so that's one of the first things to do is stop when you see somebody else thinking of them as having a particular fault. Do a double check with yourself and see, okay, maybe there's something going on here inside because we do project those things outward onto other people all the time. Next paragraph, be aware that every action of enlightened beings, spiritual masters and bodhisattvas, has a deep meaning that reflects their intentions to benefit beings. And so we may think what they're doing is not a particularly good thing to do, whereas their intention and their action and their relationship with that person may change the dynamic of that in ways that we don't understand. And so we need to be very careful about being critical of what they're doing because of that. They might seem to be ordinary, even take the form of wild animals, birds, or dogs. Many bodhisattvas manifested as beggars, rough-looking people, and so forth. Talopa killed fish. Saraha was an aerosmith. Shavaripa, a hunter, and so forth. So they came in forms of people that we might think, well, gee, that's not exactly the Dharma and not exactly what they should be doing. But we need to be careful about those kinds of things. Um, and then um, in the middle of the next paragraph, last one on the page there, Buddha's offers are free from all selfish intentions and everything they do is the application of skillful means. So at a certain point we get to a level where whatever it is that we do is based on good intention and is likely to result in good results. Okay? So we have to, we're not quite at that level, we need to be able to step back and just let that happen. Uh, unless it's some obvious abuse or something like that. Now, those kind of things do happen too. Uh, even among people that we highly respect, all of a sudden things come out about things that they've done, the way that they've abused other people and so forth. And, and those things do happen. Uh, we need to be careful about hiding secrets uh, uh, related to uh, abusive uh, kinds of behavior. Top of page 181. To recognize Bodhisattva's perfect goodness and with confidence and faith to see everything as pure will ensure that your Dharma practice does not become rotten at the root. Next line, of the seven noble qualities, there's a list on page 250, faith is the most noble of all. See the teacher as a real Buddha and whatever he or she does as a manifestation of his or her perfect wisdom. The way you behave should be in harmony with the teacher and with all your Dharma friends. A couple lines down, your presence is never oppressive or constraining. So one of the things that we keep in mind here is the middle way. Okay? Uh, some of these things are don't go to extremes with these things, uh, as opposed to don't do anything at all. Or completely avoid it, which would be the other extreme. So we think about it in the middle way, that could be a helpful guideline uh, in, in terms of whether or not it might be appropriate, but appropriate for us to engage in, but also reflecting on it first before we just jump in automatically. And then uh, next paragraph, keep your perception pure, considering that all appears to be infinite purity. Okay? So pure view. From the Tantra point of view, we look at everything from the perspective of pure view. And then skipping a little quote there, for the Vajrayana, faith and pure vision are the two main roots of practice. Once you have developed them, try constantly to increase them. As soon as you think or do something that goes against faith and pure vision, be aware of it. Confess and counter it right away. Set your own defects right instead of those of others. This will help preserve the purity of the Samaya and maintain harmony within the Sangha. So that's, that's good advice, things we need to do with that caveat about sometimes we need to share other things that are going on if we're, if we're concerned about certain kinds of behavior. 
Then the last, next to the last line in that section, then the antidote is to see the primordial purity of everything. And that has been one of the, the, the problems, too, that's come out in some of the stories in the press in the last few years about um, leaders within in individual groups uh, abusing people, mostly women. But that, those kind of abuses that have gone on um, remain secret a lot of times simply because of guidelines like this that say, keep it to yourself and don't share those things. And so we need to be careful about that and maintain uh, the view also of doing good, doing what's right, and so forth. And uh, make sure that if you see somebody that's being abused, then that comes out and we, we share it in a way that uh, can be addressed. And then section C here, to give up attachment to sponsor's property. Verse 33, offerings and respect may bring discord and cause listening, reflection, and meditation to decline. Therefore, avoid attachment to the homes of friends and benefactors is the practice of a bodhisattva. So maybe they've got a nicer home than we do, and so you can become attached to that. So that can become a problem. Uh, focus on the affairs of their particular life, their lifestyle, um, and wanting to become wealthy, like somebody who happens to be um, somebody who's famous or has power, wanting those kind of things. Uh, you know, sometimes we call it the American dream. <laughs> um, it's what a lot of people view it as. You know, they want to be powerful or wealthy or famous. Yet you would probably be resentful of anyone wealthier or more, wealth, more influential than yourself even if you achieved these things. I remember a talk, and I know I've mentioned this a number of different times, uh, Ted Turner a number of years ago when he was the second wealthiest person in the world in an interview, and they were asking him, he said, you have more money than you could ever spend. You know, why are you continuing to want to pursue uh, this goal of more and more wealth. And he said, well, it's not about the wealth, it's about the rank. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's amazing what kind of people will do sometimes. Uh, there are other people in the world who have incredible amounts of wealth, among the most wealthy people in the world, who contribute vast sums of that to various purposes and causes to help benefit all kinds of beings. And yeah, they may live in nice houses and they may have other kinds of nice things in their lifestyle, but one of their main focus is to take that wealth and give it away. In fact, there is actually a group of people, I forget the name of, of the group, that meet on a regular b basis of billionaires. You have to be a billionaire to get into the group, but you make a pledge to give away at least half of your wealth um, to charities. And then they meet and they talk about how they can better do that and, and what's going on with uh, different places in the world that need help and, and those kind of things. It's a very honorable kind of thing. The Buddha talked about the same kind of thing. It's not about wealth, it's what you do with that wealth. So, um, it's, it's the kind of thing here that can become problematic, so we need to be careful about that. Moving over to the next page, 183 here, below the, the two quotes there. Make a clean break from all ordinary activities. Be content with whatever you have and satisfied with whatever happens. Um, and then there's a quote here from Gyaltsi Tokme, who is the, the author of our uh, 37 Practices, to feel satisfied with whatever you have, that is the ultimate wealth. Okay? Being satisfied, being content. To not to crave to, or be attached to anything at all, that is the ultimate happiness. So not craving, not wanting things that we don't have, not clinging to things that we already have and so forth, those are the things we have to be careful about, not being attached. But some moderation is also appropriate, as the Buddha repeatedly reminded us. And then in the last two lines there, you may experience hardships, but later those give way to great happiness and serenity. 
Worldly activities are the opposite. They seem to bring happiness, but later they deteriorate into suffering. Such is their nature. And so one of the classic examples would be you go out to eat, a nice dinner, and so you have an appetizer, and then you have a salad, and then you have a main course, and you have dessert, and pretty soon your stomach is aching because you ate way too much, had with too much to drink, and so forth. So the good things in extremes can also create negative effects for us. So we have to be careful about those. Again, the moderation can be very helpful. and. The, the forms of happiness, the, the research that's been, well, it's been around for forever uh, before research was done, but the research also has been done more recently on these. So uh, the, the idea of happiness based on the hedonic treadmill, you know, continuously trying to get things uh, as opposed to eudaimonia, which is the more transcendent form of happiness, which is the kind that we're after here when we talk about the ultimate form of happiness in terms of Buddhist tradition. That's a more lasting form of happiness. And then D here, give up harsh speech. And if we talked about that a little bit before, but uh, reiterated again more specifically here in verse 34, harsh words disturb the minds of others and spoil our own bodhisattva practice. Therefore, to give up rough speech, which others find unpleasant, is the practice of a bodhisattva. So again, never say things that are hurtful to others as a part of that. That can only lead to anger. They respond uh, in kind with harsh speech of their own, so to speak, and sometimes worse. Uh, only say kind and gentle words that will encourage them. So that's kind of the antidote, is speaking with gentle language. And then quarrels, resentment, and feuds all arise because of tolerance and patience being lacking. Nagarjuna, in his letter to a friend, the words of people speak uh, are of three kinds, which the Buddha described as being like honey, flowers, or excrement. <laughs> Don't even have to read the next lines to know what he's talking about. Words that help and please are like honey, words that are honest and true are like flowers, but violent, harmful words are, and falsehoods are like excrement and must be abandoned. On the next page, second paragraph. The way a bodhisattva uses speech, in contrast, is to bring people onto the path. He or she would start by saying things and telling stories that open people's minds by making them happy, and then gradually and skillfully introduce them to the meaning of Dharma. So we often see that in the sutras, the Buddha, the way that he taught, particularly when he was giving instructions to someone who was not one of his followers, who would come to him to ask for his advice, and he'd start off by just giving them some uh, just general kind of instruction, asking them some questions, and then giving them some feedback on that, and then gradually turning it over into, this is how you would do this in terms of the Dharma. Because by then, they've already kind of accepted the principle involved, and then they receive the actual instructions on how to do that. Um, down about five lines from the bottom of that paragraph, he taught them, uh, uh, the futility of the eight ordinary preoccupations, uh, those are listed on page 250, but again, those are, are the eight um, ordinary uh, obscurations that we have in uh, our everyday lives, and how to permeate their practice with bodhicitta by giving rise to truly altruistic attitude and direct, uh, by directing it to the benefit of others. Everything they think, in everything that they think and do and say, add that. So we'll take a short break here. <laughs> 